Welcome back. From medium-sized power, what is the best course of action for Australia to take to try and get justice for the victims and their families, as well as try and get to the truth about who was responsible for the missile attack on a civilian aircraft? Many are applauding the stance our Prime Minister has taken so far. But what options does Russian President Putin have and also the United States? I spoke a little earlier to Brendan O'Connor, Associate Professor in American Politics at the US Study Centre at the University of Sydney. He's a specialist in American foreign policy and presidential politics. Brendan O'Connor, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Now, one of the immediate priorities of Australia is obviously to ensure safe and secure repatriation of the bodies of victims to this country. Tony Abbott has sent a team of 45 to Ukraine, including Special Envoy Angus Houston. What hope is there of that happening and happening quickly? Well, things don't look good, do they? I mean, this hasn't proceeded very well from the beginning. Uh, these people have been killed in uh, an area that's basically in the middle of a civil war and not controlled by the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian government. So that would have been the obvious group to take charge here. So short of the Ukrainian government or UN special force taking charge, what has happened is that these rebels have been dealing with the bodies. Um, that's been highly undesirable. It's probably contaminated some of the evidence. So getting people these bodies, having the bodies properly dealt with, uh, you know, just hasn't proceeded well to this point. And to believe that that's going to change overnight is probably to be a little bit too hopeful, unfortunately. Brendan, the other priority is to get the UN resolution to allow full and unfettered access to the crash site. Is that one of the best ways for Australia to get progress, given that we're, you know, a medium-sized nation, to get that UN Security Council backing? That's the right way to do it. It's the most sensible way to do it, but it's a complicated process because, of course, Russia is on the Security Council. It has uh, it's a permanent member. It has a veto. Uh, it ha will have to be, in some ways, dealt with, placated, uh, involved heavily in this process. It's not a neutral player in this process. Obviously, these are Russian-backed separatists. So it's just a very unfortunate situation. And I'm sure it's incredibly difficult for those who have family over there to uh, have to un put up with this politics and have to deal with how convoluted this inevitably will be. Well, our government on this UN resolution, our government seems to be saying publicly that they believe there'd be no reason for Russia not to support the resolution. Uh, and, and if it's true that um, Vladimir Putin has said, you know, he wants to help, do you think that Russia will support the resolution? It's hard to know. I mean, I, I think there'll be a lot of pressure on them to support it. And I think they're tactically they may support it, but whether that leads to immediate access, how, uh, you know, how much evidence has already been taken away, how UN forces deal with some of these uh, you know, separatist groups, whether there's uh, you know, a need to be pretty cautious of uh, young men with guns, obviously. So even if a resolution is gained, the practice of following that resolution out it will probably be trickier than most people would hope and more convoluted. But are you under any doubt that Russia could tell those pro-Russian rebels to back off and let people in? Well, if it I'd, wanted to? If it used its own military and that, that would create another complicating factor. So I don't think Russia is entirely in control of these rebel separatists. Uh, some of them have, have gained a lot of help, probably support. Um, some of their weapons, obviously, from Russia, uh, but it's not, you know, an entirely cooperative force. It's not part of the Russian military. So there's going to be, I think, a need to just be sensible. You don't want more lives lost uh, trying to get these, uh, you know, these bodies from a group of people who are probably somewhat chaotic, uh, probably some degree of, uh, you know, most reports have a degree of drinking involved uh, in those reports. So it's just... It's an unfortunate situation. Brendan, I mean, the other area that many commentators are talking about are sanctions. Now, we already, the West has sanctions against Russia because of the Ukraine war that's been going on. Are much tougher sanctions, by Europe in particular, also needed to bring Russia to actually fully cooperate? Or 
On the other hand, is the outrage of the world and the very firm finger pointing by world leaders enough to force Russia to take proper action? I think the first step we need to go through here is try to establish where this uh, anti-aircraft uh, equipment comes from. Uh, was it supplied by the Russians? Was there some training by the Russians? Uh, there are some reports, probably the minority opinion, that it, this could have been stolen from the Ukrainian military, that it could have been gained from the Ukrainians. So I think that needs to be established. And are you in any doubt? Because US Secretary of State John Kerry did not seem to be in any doubt. He, he seemed to be saying that the, uh, the Ukrainian weapon was nowhere near that area at that time. But are you in any doubt that it was most probably a Russian-supplied missile shot by Russian-supported and trained rebels in that part of pro-Russian rebel-controlled Ukraine? I think it's very likely everything you say is likely that this is Russian weaponry. Whether it was supplied or whether how it got gained, I think we should be quite cautious and just go through the steps here. I mean, the Lockerbie air disaster in 1988 is a good parallel. The immediate, all the immediate attention went on to Iran, it went on to Syria, and a lot of time was wasted where it was obviously Libya that was the country that had had the connection. So I think it's better to be precise. Of course, we want. You know, we want quick answers, but it's better to be precise and say this is actually what the chain of action was, this is where the responsibility lies, and then prosecute this through the International Criminal Court, possibly through sanctions, uh, tougher sanctions against Russia. But I think we're better off to get the details correct rather than maybe a little bit of rushing to judgment here. Well, that's interesting too. And of course, that Lockerbie disaster, that, that was interesting, that point that you raise about it eventually being Libya. You also say that you think, or your assessment so far, is that Vladimir Putin is not in control, despite his trying to sort of look like he's a cabinet, he and his cabinet are in control, even though they're distancing themselves from this. Does that mean that even though they might be trained and sponsored by Russia, that he can't actually control these rebels? This is a very difficult question to know because the reporting from this area, most people's knowledge of this conflict is, you know, limited, uh, myself included. So I think Obama is right to say that Putin is the player in the world, the leader in the world that can do the most here uh, to curtail this uh, civil war in the Ukraine who can pull uh, you know support from these rebel groups but he can't entirely uh, you know curtail their violence he's not probably entirely in control so he can do a lot he can certainly do a lot more than he can and the Russians have aggravated this problem very severely over the last few months but we can't um, you know he, he won't be up to do everything so he'll be playing a I, he has played a very dangerous game on this question of at some levels apologising, some levels promising to do things, but not entirely, I'd say, even being able to deliver if his goodwill was there. And his goodwill is probably not there. He's, uh, he's probably playing a very double-sided game on this. Or, well, my next question was going to be, I mean, there has been a little tiny bit of progress in the past 24 hours. At least Putin took Tony Abbott's phone call. The PM today said that Putin had said all the right things to him on the phone. Now, I know Tony Abbott also then went on to express a little bit of suspicion about that, about whether the follow through will be there. But from your expertise, looking at a character like Vladimir Putin, who was part of the KGB for so long, is this all obfuscation or will Putin do something concrete to help the West get what it wants? I think we're probably better off to look at this as very much a kind of post-Cold War thing. Sure, Putin has this history in the old Soviet Union, but this is something very different. This is a kind of nationalist struggle. Sure, R Russia has felt that it's lost a lot of its pride. It feels that the that NATO and the EU have encroached into its sort of sphere of influence. So, in some ways, Russia, Russia and Putin particularly, has acted as a sense of kind of wounded pride. So, I think we're we're better off to deal with it as a kind of post Cold War issue, not really treated as an extension of the old Cold War fight. OK, so if it's a post-Cold War issue, how, what would his modus operandi be, do you reckon? 
Well, I think his, his mode has been to say, look, Ukraine is really in the Russian sphere. It cannot become too pro-NATO, too pro-EU. It's got to take a politics which is somewhat more neutral, at least in, in line with Russia's interests. Now, I think he's, he's overplayed this. He's engaged in violence. He's engaged in very questionable activities in eastern Ukraine, taking of Crimea, the, the referendum there and the like. But there is, I think, an, e an importance to get the context right because this is uh, a time where a lot of people will be saying, look, there's a need for a degree of revenge. And if there is going to be punishment of Russia, and there probably needs to be, I think we're better off to be pretty precise about what we're trying to achieve and what, um, what has been going on in the recent history of the Ukraine. Well, I mean, US Secretary of State John Kerry and President Obama have been very strong in their words on this too, as well as our Prime Minister. But what are Barack Obama's options? Well, that's, that's been the big problem here. Obama hasn't had many options in recent months. I mean, the Republicans will say Obama has been too weak. He's a vacillator. He doesn't use US power. But really, this is on Russia's border. Uh, this is like the United States uh, doing something in the Caribbean or in South America. It's very hard for outside powers to have that much influence. So it's been a very difficult issue for Obama. And I think Obama in the main has maybe not spoken up enough about this issue, but the US, I think, has played a probably pretty good hand on this. But this, this shooting down of this airline will be, I think, a game change because the international condemnation that rightly comes with it will, I think, lead to countries like Germany, who have not been as tough as the United States on, say, economic sanctions, taking another look at this issue and saying, look, this has got a bit out of hand. Uh, Putin could do a lot to reduce the conflict here. And I think the United States and uh, countries like Australia moving through the UN will build a pretty strong coalition against the Russians. And that's why I think you see these placating words from Putin, because this actually could be uh, somewhat of a disaster for him and his, uh, you know, his intentions in the Ukraine. Has Germany, for instance, you mentioned them, they're very dependent on Russian energy, oil and gas, up to a third of German energy comes from Russia. Have they been loud enough in their criticism? Have they been uh, insistent enough with their pressure on Russia? They've issued statements saying it's Russia's last chance. I mean, David Cameron has said, well, Russia's gone beyond its last chance. Uh, you know, it had its last chance previously. But I think it's the strongest condemnation we've got from Germany. You're very much right about gas links between uh, Germany and Russia. And that's, I think, kept the Germans one of the most cautious on this issue in general. Didn't condemn actions in the Crimea as loud as a number of other countries. So I think there has been a significant movement with Germany. And I think this is this is something that the russians the issues like the g20 discussed you know in a lot of reports over the last few days where the russians don't want to see themselves totally isolated and they're i think in uh you know they're in grave danger of being that sort of you know isolated nation with very few allies or very few nations willing to uh you know see their side of this just briefly, Brendan O'Connor, back to President Obama. He has two major crises really on his plate, the violence and bloodshed in Gaza too. Will he be considered possibly a lame duck on both these flashpoint issues? Well, often events change the way we see presidents. I mean, events can change a narrative. So I think the event of the shooting down of this airline, unfortunate as it is, tragic. It gives Obama a chance to play to his strong suit, his, his ability to talk uh, about a complex issue in a compelling way. And I think he could build a coalition. So I think he could turn this issue around. The Israeli-Palestinian issue, that is one where he, I think, will see it as much more risky uh, to talk up the negatives on both sides, to try to turn this into uh, an opportunity for peace. He's, done, he's had very little success there. And I think on that issue, some might say, well, both John Kerry and Barack Obama haven't really achieved very much. And uh, that, that issue, in fact, seems to just be getting worse by the day. Brendan O'Connor, just finally on the Ukraine issue, is this the type of event that can trigger a, an escalation to take it to war? Or will no one really take on Russia, want to take on Russia, have any stomach for it, which still has nuclear weapons?
I think Obama's style, and Obama will lead the West on this, Obama's style is very much to use diplomatic means, to use the United Nations, to use economic sanctions. Obama is not a person who talks up military action as a good option. And I think that's the right approach, and it'll be the approach taken. I think it's very unlikely this is going to trigger any action by NATO or it's going to lead to a military escalation. Now, the Republicans will, uh, you know, rhetorically in America criticize, condemn Obama, talk a much tougher language, but I think their solutions are not very feasible and I think Obama's solutions are really the best we've got, although there'll be a lot of muddling through. All right, Brendan O'Connor, we will leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to talk with you.